Good evening and welcome. I'm Lex Runciman of the Linfield English Department, and it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce a once and continuing esteemed colleague, wonderful writer, and friend, Barbara Drake, a person who is more than anyone responsible for the current success of Linfield's creative writing major. She is an accomplished essayist, as her book, Peace at Heart, demonstrates. She has authored a widely used and important textbook, Writing Poetry. But more important this evening is the fact of Barbara's new book of poems from Windfall Press, Driving 100. Moans at 9.30 PM. Dark enough now to look at Jupiter with a little telescope. Four moons visible. I call the grandchildren to see it, but they jiggle the telescope and I can't get it back. Mosquitoes are gathering. What is near is good also. Before going inside, we'll take a quick peek at our big white moon, our constellation moon. I mean, you can always get the moon in the telescope, right? <laughs> if you can. And the little kids, it's hard. They always touch it, and it's gone. So, Photographs show up in my poems a lot because my dad was a photographer, and I like to take pictures. And I have a sister who's a photographer, and a daughter who's a photographer, and so on. And like those pictures of the relatives, everybody has a picture box, or at least one and more. And uh, this is a, about a photograph that I have that my dad took of my mother. In the eye of one who loves you. The dunes fill the picture, their ribbed surfaces like sand at low tide. The shadows behind each dune black as the far side of the moon. And there is my mother, a tiny figure walking across the sand. I imagine she likes looking at this photograph because it reminds her of being in my father's eye as, from a distance, he took the picture. He is gone now, but in this picture, he always has his eye on her. We live out in the country near Yam Hill, and, and it's 20 acres, kind of a funky little farm, but we really love it, and it's got woods and fields and so on. And you know, if you've had a place in the country, or even if a vacation place or something, and you always walk around and just look and see what's going on. So that's what's, I mean, maybe if you even have an apartment in town, you do that. And so this is called The Rounds, and it's about going out and looking at the place. How do you speak to the tree in the field with the voice of a red-winged blackbird? And here I am in the pasture making my daily rounds. Every day is different, something new. Something with a face like silk and eyes from a science fiction movie. Something with breath like wind over yellow winter grass. Something with teeth or mandibles or roots, with egg sac fur or a stamen and pistol. How do you greet Frog's Pond in the West Pond? With amazement and expectation. One day ice crystals are flashing their blue lights. The next, an intimation of spring in the changing color of lungwort, in the vibrations of dark pools at the base of oak trees. Where is the rose hip hidden in the thorny stem, in the thread of its being? Remember that ice and snowstorm we had a year ago at Christmas? I mean, a little over a year now. And, uh, People ask me about that line, one day ice crystals are flashing their blue lights, you know, and, and I said, well, you know, when it's like that, there's ice in the snow and you chop through it with a shovel and you see that blue light, it's like the color of glaciers in Alaska, you would know what that's like, you know, and they weren't sure what I was talking about, but it was doing that a lot during that Christmas storm because there were layers of ice in it, and I, I thought it was so great, I kept going out, <laughs> getting it to go, do that. So, anyway, this is a day with yoga in it and other things. And it's another longish narrative. Still dark. <clears throat> Still dark when I reach to turn the alarm off before it can ring. December 2nd, 2008. 
I drive to yoga class where we do downward dog, dancing warrior, warrior number two, triangle, dancing triangle, the bridge. I don't like the bridge. <laughs> Finally, we get to the pigeon, a collapsed kind of pose, then shavasana. Thought I'd buy Christmas chocolate for my brother on the way home, but the handmade chocolate store doesn't open till 11, so I go on to find Bill in the driveway sliding a crate into the truck. A barn owl, he says, injured in the ditch. He's off to meet an Audubon rep in Newburgh. The owl in shock looks pitiful, so light, so small, compared to the grand dignity of looking down from high rafters from flight. He has wrapped it in towels to travel. Can it survive? I ride along. After we turn the owl over to the woman with the same name as mine, we stop at the Newburgh Panaderia for a donut. Their donuts are better than other donuts. The man behind the counter speaks Spanish. The customers ahead of me speak something that sounds Middle Eastern. Might donuts be a common language? I don't usually buy donuts, but if I pass the panaderia, it's hard not to stop, and I feel sad about the owl. Donut comfort, but not enough. All along the road, we see raptors, kestrels, red tails, a marsh hawk. Back home, a red tail flies up from the vineyard and perches at the top of a fir tree. Do birds notice what happens to other birds? Bill asks me, should we call later and ask about the owl? I don't want to know if it dies, I tell him. He says he will call the Audubon office anyway. He won't tell me if it didn't make it. Well, I say, then that will be obvious. <laughs> <clears throat> When he calls, I hear him from the other room. His voice drops, so I know the owl died. They tell him shock, hypothermia, dehydration. They did their best. After these few hours of light, it's dark again. I walk out to see the conjunction of the moon, Venus, and Jupiter like a festival in the sky. In mythologies, the dead sometimes rise and turn into constellations. Orion the hunter will be up soon. I'd like to look up and find a tiny barn owl sitting on Orion's shoulder. As long as nobody's bothered by it or flooded, their house isn't flooded or something like that, I really love the winter rain that fills the fields up. You know, have you been up near Gaston lately? And those fields that used to be the onion fields are just full of water. It looks so beautiful and there are birds out there and everything. So I like seeing flooded fields in the winter. And um, I don't remember what month I wrote this, and I don't think I say in here, but, <coughs> you know, it's not winter, but I think of it at this time. It's called Wetland. Wapato is blooming this month. Sagittaria latifolia, a round root the size of hen's eggs. That's a quote out of a plant book. Favored as food by native inhabitants of Oregon, once abundant around here. Driving north, I pass a pond full of wapato now blooming, the small white flowers elevated on long stems like spots of sunlight on shiny leaves. Later, going south, I see the farmer unloading drain pipe for the field at the curve. <clears throat> It means he is going to put an end to the silver pools that stand there in winter. I know he is tired of farming, wants to subdivide, build houses at the bend of the road into town. I feel a sigh of grief, thinking I will no longer see that pond in winter. The water will rush away, as if it were an unwelcome guest saving face, pretending it has somewhere more important to go. Once in the Wapato Marsh, I saw a red mare standing in water up to her chest. <clears throat> her neck arched as she pulled wet weeds from her mouth. I never go past there without hoping to see her again, to see the red horse up to her broad chest, mouthing weeds. Um, this is about a cabin that um, 
a little shack, I should say, down on the south coast that I've had since 1974. And I was thinking about this, uh, remembering that when I applied for the job at Linfield, I had another poem about the place. And I read it at my reading where you give a demonstration when you're applying. And it was about how I just wanted to be back in Oregon because I had this place here. <laughs> and my mother said, oh, that was shameless of you. <laughs> when I told her I read it so people would feel sorry for me and give me this job. <laughs> Anyway, probably didn't, that didn't make any difference, I'm sure. <laughs> but anyway, this is about that same place. It's called Ceremony. The tiny cabin in the clearing, surrounded by old trees, is barely shelter in a rainstorm. Leaks around the windows, is shared with spiders. Now and then, a banana slug off course veers in, lays its shining trail. Mouse-nibbled comic books go back 30 years at least to kids lounging in the Mexican hammock slung between alders, legs braced to spread the cotton weave, heads propped for reading Archie, Betty, and Veronica, Casper the Ghost, Richie Rich, Green Lantern. That fossilized seashell from a Cape Blanco midden has been sitting on the porch rail since 1976. This bottle of homemade blackberry wine on the high shelf, vintage 1980, no one in their right mind will ever drink it. Collar from a long gone dog hangs from a nail on the wall. There's a dusty baseball cap and a sickle to clear the trail. This place is a monument to the dust covered but not forgotten, to light and dark, to smoke and mirrors, to children growing up and having children. Each summer, we fill the place with new life, haul out the Coleman stove, light the propane lantern, beat down the grass, clip back a year's growth of blackberry vines, restock the outhouse with toilet paper kept dry under a rusted coffee can, sweep out spiders, webs, dead, dead flies, polish windows, plant tents in the clearing, <coughs> spread sleeping bags, rebuild in the woods a village of kinship. Then we go to the river, wade in, and with voices cunning and persuasive to those still on the rocky bank, we call out the pleasing lie. Come in, come in, it's not cold. <laughs> and even the little ones do, like dragons ritually washed in season, we swim. Thank you. Thank you.